What's up, everyone? Nick from Comic Culture here. It's time for Nick at Night, my weekly non-spoiler comic book review show. We got a ton of books to get through, so let's get started right now. I'm going to go ahead and put my grading scale up. How this works is I'm going to go over each book and put the cover of that book on the grading scale so you can see how they stack up against each other. With that said, let's get into it with the big two, as we always do, starting with Sergeant Rock versus the Army of the Dead. This is issue number five, and I think I missed issue number four, but essentially it's a, it's a war story. These guys are going after Hitler right now. Hitler actually found a way with his scientists to resurrect some of their fallen soldiers into these zombies. And so we're following our little squad here, Sergeant Rock and our heroes into the depths of the war, trying to get to Hitler. And they got him cornered downstairs in the bunker towards the end of this book. It's insane. It's a really great book. I, I got into it around Halloween time last year and I thought I would probably fall off of it, but I actually went ahead and pre-ordered issue number six because it's such a fun, cool, quick read interesting artwork. So I like a lot of that kind of stuff that's happening inside this book. So I'm anxious to see exactly how it ends. We have our Sergeant Rock and our heroes here planning how they're going to attack Hitler, who is actually hunkered down right now inside of his bunker. And it's heavily guarded with these zombie-like characters. So it's actually a fun read. If you're into like wartime comics, if you want something a little lighter, a little supernatural element to it, this book is probably for you. Really simple yet effective art style in here as well, which is really awesome to see. So I've been digging this book so far. I missed issue number four. It didn't slow down my enjoyment at all of the issue. Number six will come out next month. We'll be wrapping the series up. It's a pretty fun book. So if you're into that kind of a thing, check this one out. The next book we read was Detective Comics 1068, written by Rom V, a very much Rom V style book. I've set up before. If you're reading the other Rom V books right now and you're just missing that classic feel that he can bring to a title, pick up Detective Comics because that's what you're going to get inside of here. We have some new power rolling into Gotham right now, taking over the Narrows, and we understand what their plan is in doing that. We have some Two-Face action in here, some potential team-ups with Batman. Batman way in over his head. He doesn't quite know how he's going to handle this threat that's attacking Gotham right now. And so we have some unlikely allies coming to the rescue towards the end of the book. What does it mean for the long term? Who knows? But I'm appreciating some of the team-ups and some of the cool action panels in here. Art's really cool as well. We got a lot of cool gnarly battles and things like that. Attention to detail. And it definitely has that Rom V flair, even in the art too, which I think is really great when an artist and a writer can sync up like that. I love the little twist towards the end. Some characters they bring back in. Characters we saw recently in another run, still a Batman run, but they're bringing back in this book as well. Cool little Danny art. And I believe it's Cy Spurrier on the back story as well. This is giving you some more context um, in the world in general. So uh, yeah, this is not a bad book. If you're looking for a Rom V style book, definitely pick up Detective and you can probably drop the other ones. Human Target issue number 11 from Tom King and Greg Smallwood. I've said it before, if you don't like Tom King's writing because of the typical tropes and some of the weird stuff that he does, this book still might be for you, so check it out, at least for the Greg Smallwood art. It's incredible. Very intriguing story in here. It's kind of like a murder mystery in a way, but we're trying to figure out his own murder. So Christopher Chance was actually poisoned at the very beginning of this book. He's going through Justice League members trying to figure out if they're involved in some way. He finds some details and we have this revelation in the last issue, which really kind of set us off course, which is absolutely insane, but also somewhat predictable at the same time. This issue here explores how that could have happened and why it happened. And so where do you go from there with the knowledge that we have? Uh, Greg Smallwood's doing a killer job with the art. Sometimes he blows out these multi-panel shots right here, and he plays around with a lot of the shadowing and some of the coloring as well, which I think is really unique in comics today. And then we just have these beautifully pristine scenes like this as well, where they're just kind of chilling on the water, but it's done in such a beautiful way. And then very much similar to the last issue, we have an insane little cliffhanger at the end, and I can't wait for issue number 12. This has been a heck of a book. I'm loving this one so far. What are you guys thinking about this one? And are you reading it? Let me know down below. Thor issue 30 from Grombeck and Nick Klein. It's a really great read. I, I, I do like the fact that it's continuing still at an interesting pace and an interesting story since Donnie left. Donnie has a way of jumping on titles, introducing a lot of things into them, and then kind of abandoning them um, as he trails off. This is actually a story that picks up some of the things that we were introduced to 
in those previous Thor runs. So that is really cool. We see some familiar villain faces in here as well. We don't exactly know all the details yet and what's actually going on right here, but we have Thor and some Valkyries going through right now into this mysterious cave-like realm, and they're exploring some of their past family's memories. And so it's interesting to see how certain events played out in the past and how they actually affect them in present day. Nick Klein on the art is murdering it on the art. Some of these panels are absolutely gorgeous. I cannot believe that he was able to pull some of this stuff off. Very interesting story. I like the direction we're heading in right now. It feels like a darker Thor. So if you're missing that element to Donnie's run, we're definitely kind of getting more of that inside of this issue here. So I'm excited to see where it goes for sure. There's a lot of interesting elements and there's a surprise character at the very end. I'll let you read it to figure it out, which has gotten me extra excited to keep reading Thor. So not bad. It's certainly picking up from where we left off. If you had any doubts on it because of Donnie's involvement on the run and him coming off of it, I'd say give these issues a try. If you're not still sold, I don't know what to tell you. Check it out. Star Wars High Republic The Blade issue number two from Charles Soule. Another strong issue of The Blade. I really like the character dynamics and the, the relationship between our two Jedis here. We understand a little bit about how they were brought up, how they kind of cheated the system to stay with each other through their Jedi Academy. And then I love how you can see them more in adult form right here. And they're actually uh, helping each other out in the ways that we were introduced to when they were kids, like one stronger in one element than the other person. And so they feed on those strengths and they actually make a hell of a duo, which is awesome. The art is really raw and sketchy and it looks great for this kind of a book, especially with the action scenes and the lightsaber battles. So that is really fun. The situation we're in right now, our, our Jedis are trying to still figure out like who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. They were brought in to help a team. They got their side of the story. They're going to the other side to get their side of the story. And they're kind of caught in the middle of this war now. And they're trying to figure out who's who, who's actually the good guy, who's the bad guy, and what do they do? But I think it's safe to say for now, they're basically just trying to stay alive at this point. And uh, it's a pretty cool book. So this one's actually really fun. So I would recommend this one. And I would recommend Star Wars High Republic Adventures from Dark Horse. Those are the two books that I'm reading so far in the Star Wars universe that are better than the other ones that I'm reading. So Blade's pretty fun. Check it out. Sins of Sinister issue number one. I don't know what the heck's going on in here. I was reading Immortal. I'm reading X-Men proper and I'm jumping into this book and I'm like, how did the world change so much between uh, the last issue I read and this issue here? But I did not read the last issue of Immortal, which I was told helps. Uh, kind of piece some of the stuff together. Now, Sinister's been plotting behind the scenes with his different Moiras and things like that. And we've been kind of planting the seeds here and there ever since the Hickman run that something was going to come. I think the execution and what actually happened was kind of quick, maybe. Uh, we went from nothing really into this complete overtake of Mr. Sinister. And he's pretty much everywhere right now with his clones doing all the dirty work. And we're completely changing the way everything is handled in this book at the point. So this might be a little bit jarring for people who are not completely up to date with like X-Men Red and uh, Mortal X-Men and everything else. So you really have to read those ancillary titles, not necessarily the main X-Men run to be prepared for this book. So if you're that person, great, jump right in and you're gonna have a heck of a time art wise. It's great. There's some panels that are just absolutely amazing and some panels you can tell were just kind of done pretty quickly, but you got some awesome two page spreads. It's very heavy in the X-Men lore and mythos, especially around Mr. Sinister. So be prepared for that. But with that said, fun, interesting. I didn't read enough to prepare myself for this one personally, but I'm jumping right in head first. We'll see where it takes us. It's pretty cool. Then from Dynamite, we have Darkwing Duck issue number one. What a cool book. I remember watching the show when I was a kid. I don't know if there's many other comics or anything like that since then, but I watched the show when I was a kid. I love singing the song and everything. And uh, so a lot of people are probably going to compare this to Gargoyles because it came out recently and it was, again, one of those like 90s nostalgic trips. And I would say Darkwing Duck does a much better job of bringing us up to speed about where we are with our characters and everything. Everything that was slowing us down from Gargoyles 1 doesn't exist in here. We have a very cool, um, likely situation for Darkwing Duck to be in. We have his family around him. We have his friends around him. We have some familiar villains showing up as well, trying to terrorize and sabotage this event that we're being seen right now. Uh, art style, it reminds me of what I remember from the, from the show itself. So I was not disappointed from that perspective either. It's really fun. It's kooky. All the characters seem familiar and uh, I just loved it. It was really good. So it might not be a book that I'm going to keep up with going forward. It's just a book that I was glad hasn't changed much from the show. 
you know, the story, the characters and things like that. It was always a great little nostalgic trip. I'm glad I went on the adventure. Maybe I'll pick up issue number two, especially if the reviews come out and they're really good or I'll flip through them and see what's going on. But it's very much like the show. So if you're into that whole thing, you want it back in your life. Now's the time to do it. Check this one out. From Aftershock, we have Samurai Doggy issue number three. And if you were hoping to get a idea of what the hell's actually going on in the story, who our main character is, what the motivations are, some kind of, you know, plot or something like that, you're not going to get it in this book. But you are going to get some of the best visuals that we see in comics today, I think. We have some awesome battles in here. If you like Shaolin Cowboy Cruel to begin, it's in that same vein from a visual perspective. Not nearly as detailed, but... It's still very over the top and very beautiful to look at. So you're definitely going to get that. What you're not going to get is any kind of plot or character development or explanation of what's going on. You're just going to see one dude tearing apart armies of other dudes in a very beautiful way. And you're going to get very little dialogue, probably less than 50 words in the entire book. And we're not going to know exactly what the hell is actually going on in here. So, like I said, I don't know anything about Samurai Doggy. I don't know if this is the first edition, if this is the second volume. I don't know anything about this. And I still don't know after reading three issues. All I know is it's a visual treat, and I'm excited to see where it goes from here and if we're actually going to get some kind of a plot or character development or some kind of a story other than what we've seen so far. So, educate me down below if I'm missing something. There's not a whole lot going on story-wise, but it's a visual treat, so maybe that's good enough. Next from IDW, we have The Last Ronin Lost Years issue number one. This will be a volume two in the Last Ronin series right now, co-written by Kevin Eastman, and we have Tom Waltz on here as well. So this book basically explores what Michelangelo was doing before he was on his revenge mission, but after a lot of his brothers were taken out, a lot of his family was dismantled. So we know from the original Last Ronin that he kind of went into seclusion, trying to find himself, trying to find meaning in his life. He kind of went there to die, honestly, but things kind of evolved from there. He finds himself into some trouble, and then, of course, he gets led back on his mission after dealing with some of the local trouble here. So this is the story that kind of puts our turtle back on path to then go on his ultimate revenge mission in The Last Ronin. So if you're interested in that little backstory and that supplemental context, which got us to our final conclusion in our last run, pick up this one. It's pretty interesting. It's probably going to ride on a lot of the nostalgia and a lot of the excitement wave that we had coming off of The Last Ronin but I'm totally down for that. It's pretty awesome. Some flashbacks and stuff in here. It's like almost co-written co by Tom King, but it's not too confusing. Art style is, you know, what you'd come to expect from The Last Ronin. Maybe not as strong as I would like it to be all the time, but there's definitely some really cool paneling and art and things like that in here scattered amongst some of the other stuff. So was it worth it? I would say it was worth it for sure. I liked it personally. I recommend this one and The Last Ronin. It would be interesting to read this one first and then read Last Ronin last if you haven't read that one yet, but check this one out. It's pretty cool too. Traveling to Mars issue number three from a Blaze Comics. What a cruel book this is, Mark Russell. The basic concept is we have this man who's terminally ill right now. He's only got maybe a year left to live. He was actually picked by this corporation to go to Mars to lay claim to this new resource that's going to solve the global energy crisis. And the way that works right now is the first one there can lay claim to it and it's theirs forever. So we have all these different organizations and companies and countries trying to do this and he's the first one to set out. But this is not a book about action, about aliens, about anything like that. This is basically reliving the moments in this one man's life who's at it's coming to its end. All his regrets, all of his things he was accomplishing, the things he never got to do, his broken relationships with his family, with his ex-wife, with his kids, and how he's going to cope being in space alone while going through all those emotions. Luckily, we do have some robot companions joining him on the trip as well, and they're kind of learning what it means to be humans in a way because they're only programmed a certain way. But um, again, this is not an action-packed book, but it's one of my favorite books just because of how introspective this really is. And I think it's really true to some dialogue. It really makes it feel real. It's an absurd situation, but it's written extremely well. And Mark Russell does a great job of that kind of stuff. This book is incredible. I would really recommend it for anybody. Check this one out. We're only three issues in. Get it now. Once upon a time at the end of the world, we have issue number three from Jason Aaron. This is an incredible book as well. It feels like a few different books I've read in the past just kind of smashed together some cool elements from each 
brought together. We have an po- apocalyptic world. We have one survivor of that apocalyptic world that is uh, all-knowing. She knows all the tricks to staying alive. She's a survival kind of a person. She came from another group of people, and we have her engaging with this other kid who's been kind of secluded in this ivory tower in this apocalypse. Didn't have to worry about much. Was Had unlimited supplies, apparently. All this stuff. And these two people meet, and they go out on an adventure together. So first off, that premise alone is good enough. But I think what makes this book really special is the dynamic between those two. They're very much different people, but they're starting to rub off on each other in this issue. Some of the things that one character is really passionate about, it's starting to rub off on the other one, and they're kind of in a give and take relationship right now. And uh, I can see it kind of flourishing over time. We do learn a little bit more about our antagonists in here as well. They're a little bit more seen in this book compared to previous issues. It's almost like a Boy Scout troop gone wrong kind of a thing. And so that's pretty fun. And so we're going to develop that as we go. Now, in the last, uh, I think in the first issue and in this issue, the last few pages was like really far in the future. And our real soft uh, ivory tower kid has turned uh, brutally ruthless. And it's showcased at the end of this one as well. So I can't wait to see that transition towards the end. It's going to be pretty crazy to see that. And I'm really interested in the art style changes and everything. It's real gnarly. And I can't wait to get to that point. So uh, once upon a time at the end of the world, I'm loving this book so far. We're three issues in. Can't wait for more. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is from Boom. And there's also IDW on here as well. Perhaps they're sharing the rights here. I don't know too much about that. This is a volume two issue number two. And this is kind of my first um, dive into Power Rangers and TMNT comics, to be honest with you. I have read like, you know, TMNT number one, but I haven't been following at all with what's going on. But we have some cool team ups in here. I love the fact that the Power Rangers and the tur- Turtles are getting together against common threats. You know, we have like Rita and we have like Bebop and Rocksteady and all these different people all engaged together to fight each other. And this is really making me want to read volume one because this is directly playing off of the events in volume one. But if you haven't read that, you can just infer what's going on from the dialogue and the storytelling in here. But we basically have our villains attacking Earth right now. So we have our Rangers and we have our Turtles teaming back up to kind of keep them at bay. Now, is it all distraction technique? Who knows? What's the real motivation? We'll find out in this book. And what are some other unlikely allies that are going to step up and try to help save the day? You'll find out in this book here. But this has been actually a really big breath of fresh air. I love Dan Moore's art. Very, very cool. You don't need to know much about the Turtles or the Power Rangers to dive into this to appreciate it. So that's really awesome. I recommend this one. It was fire. Staying in Boom Studios, we have Behold Behemoth issue number three. This book was great too. There's a lot of good books out right now in the indie scene. So this one right here is actually playing on a little bit more of the backstory and the history between our monsters and our humans. There's actually a legacy between these characters and that is explored and explained inside of the pages here which i think is a great time to bring it in on issue number three but of course as we saw in issue number two it wouldn't be a behold behemoth book without some insane kaiju fights so we do get that we have some military zones over here too not quite understanding what's going on and then they quickly learn uh what they're actually up against (laughs) when they start engaging our monsters here but again this is a little bit not heavy but it's explaining what's going on the relationship between the humans, the monsters, and things like that, which was awesome, and I like where they're going with that. This is another one of those books that is a little bit under the radar right now. I think people should be paying attention to it because it's a fun story, interesting dynamic between the characters, amazing art style. This is a really cool book. Issue number three, if it's not on your list and you're into the indie game, you like kaiju stuff, you like some supernatural stuff, check this one out, you can't lose. Jumping over into some image books, we have Lovesick issue number four. This book is insane. If you're into the Red Room game, if you like that kind of uh, murder on the internet for fun and profit type style books, this book might be for you, but this is a little bit more personal. Unlike Red Room and Red Room Trigger Warnings, we get to understand this character Domino here and her relationship with this man also in the cover. We find out that he's actually partially responsible for the way she is. She was always a sick kid growing up, but she needed some kind of a catalyst, someone to teach her the ways to kind of level up her game. That's this story right here. So we get introduced to him, what he's up to nowadays. We get to see how our main character Domino is not quite fulfilled in her role. She's got like this weird mode she flips into whenever she's on stage and on camera, but behind the scenes, she's quite 
uncomfortable with the way she is or who she turned out to be. She's got like this fear in the, in the back of her mind as well, but kind of comes and goes in these different waves. So that part's a little bit confusing, but the character they introduced, which who helped create her, who basically gave her her origin story is really, really creepy. And so there's really not much I can show you inside this book without it being too, uh, too gory or perverse. But if you're into the Red Room scene and I think you know who you are, this book might be for you. I would check this one out. Okay, so we got Saga back in our life this month and I am so excited for it to come back in. We have 61, Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples. I love how Fiona Staples is credited first and then Brian K. Vaughn is. That just tells you how much he respects, in my opinion, uh, the artist on this book because it is absolutely incredible. This is probably the most saga feeling book that I've read since we've come back from our break when we got introduced into 55. I think this is the most saga feeling book of the last six issues. Right from the very first page, we get this shocking splash page right up front, and we go into a little bit of story time. You know, maybe some of our characters uh, had other plans for their life, and we get to see that a little bit. We have shocking moments, which brings us back into reality, into where we are, and then we get to explore our family again that we've all known and loved this entire time, and they're up to the exact same shenanigans that we have always come to expect. I love Hazel in here as well. She's absolutely incredible. She's becoming more of a mainstay in this book, or taking more main stage, I should say. She she always had that narrative element in here, which is probably one of the most charming parts about this book. She's narrated it from the very first line in this book in this entire series. And I just love that perspective, that retrospective feel. It's also fun to kind of see her growing up throughout this entire series, the different uh, shenanigans and lies and things like that, that she can kind of formulate on the fly. So I love that. She's got a great sense of humor, great mix between her mom and dad. So that is awesome. And in true saga fashion, we have some surprise people coming in, some familiar faces as well towards the end, which really uh, gets me excited for where we're going to go from there. And then they double down on the surprise element towards the end of the book with a insane, huge, shocking moment at the very end of the book. Beautiful splash page at the end. This is the most saga book I've read since we left the series a couple of years ago. It's great. It's all, it, 61 sounds like a lot of issues, but I'm telling you, if you get the trades, you can blast through this really quick. We did last year. It's insane book. Check this one out. Junkyard Joe issue number four. So, I mean, how do we top Saga? I, I don't know, but we get to that same kind of level when we start talking about Junkyard Joe from Jeff Johns and Gary Frank with Brad Anderson. So again, this is a character that spun out of the Geiger universe, which we saw maybe a year and a half, maybe two years ago, something like that. I can't remember. But pick up that trade. You get introduced to this character very briefly. And then we get to see this character take center stage inside of this run right here. But at a high level, Junkyard Joe is basically this militarized robot who was sent to Vietnam to be a replacement soldier. He actually was revealed to the platoon he was actually on, he was serving, and some of the remaining members from that platoon have grown up thinking it was kind of a delusion of theirs. They couldn't quite grasp the fact that there might have been a robot helping us, even though they saw it as clear as day. But hey, apparently war can really mess with you in that way. So we have a guy growing up his whole life thinking he may have imagined that, and he uses that imagination to his benefit, and we get to see Junkyard Joe revisiting him in his later years in life and how that's going to affect him now. What's Joe need? Who is he running from? We're figuring that out as well. I know the story sounds absolutely crazy, but the art style as well is like hauntingly beautiful. I love the way that the colors all mix. I love the line work. It's almost mechanical feeling. It's almost like a cyberpunk feel to it. I don't exactly know how to describe it, but it's muddy, but it's still clean and popping with color at the same time. This book takes us more into an area where we go into town and we see a lot more people, but the books leading up to this are a little bit more secluded, a little bit more close to the chest, but we are widening the cast of characters in this one too. Our villains are showing up a little bit more in this book as well. So we're going to really see some re reasoning behind Junkyard Joe's um, reappearance very, very soon. And then what does that mean for the people that he's now connected with? We're going to figure it out in the next issues. But like I said, Junkyard Joe is probably one of the best books out right now. Definitely in my top five for sure, probably even top three. This is a great book. Check it out. So guys, that's everything I read this week. I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know down below in the comments what you got and what your favorite books of the week were. And if you're new here, hit that like button if you enjoyed the content and consider hitting that subscribe button as well. And as I mentioned before, I do have a YouTube join button now down below. Check it out underneath this video. There's a tier for everybody and I highly appreciate it. But thanks again, everybody. Happy reading and I'll see you down below in the comments.